Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. It's an honor for you to have invited me to come here and share with you some of the fruits of the work that we've been doing over the years. Um, my discussion with you this afternoon, I have titled Language and the Future of Africa. Tomorrow I will talk to you about Tomorrow, I will talk to you about the route to unity. And I've been working on these things for years. I've lived in nine countries on the African continent, working in different institutions on the African continent. I have been in the trenches. I've been part of a war against apartheid, gun running, and also, this, this is a long time ago, this is a long time, this is in the 70s. Also, in Sudan, when I left Cambridge, went to the Sudan as a professor in the University of Juba, Anthropology and sociology. I was there when the second civil war started. And we organized an intelligence unit monitoring the troop movements of the Sudanese army between the East Bank and the West Bank of the Nile. So I've worked also even in Ghana where I was born. I was 10 years exile from Ghana. So I have a clear idea of what is going on on the ground. And uh, I'm sure that, again, we're making progress. It's slow. <laughs> now, we haven't hit rock bottom yet, but we need to go rock bottom before we start climbing up again. And that time will come with the next generation. Many of us will be gone. We don't have very much time left. But the younger generation would see greater and faster, better, steadier progress. Now, why language? Why do I want to talk about language and the future of Africa? Because Fifteen years ago, at the commencement of the era of independence in Africa, people tended to focus inordinately on issues of technicism, economic technicism, GDP, G, etc. Very economistic ideas about development. But development is ultimately development of people. It is the, the empowerment of people as collectives and individuals to have greater control over the circumstances governing their lives and the ability to use these circumstances to the benefit of themselves and the communities in which they live. Now, that is ultimately what it means. It's not just infrastructure. It's not just roads. It's not just bridges. But ultimately, the ability of the person as an individual or collective a person as belonging to a group or as an individual to be able to lift and uplift him and herself. Now, when you look at that, where we started from, we went all sorts of different ways over the years, trying to see that Africa would develop, that Africa will flourish, that indeed it will exceedingly flourish. But we see that four or five decades later, we see stagnation 
and retrogression. Instead of a fast movement forward, we see at best marking time or retrogression. And we have come to the clear conclusion that the large part of the formula and equation we need to be able to move forward is a cultural dimension of transformation. Now, without, without that appreciation, we won't get very far. Why do I say this? Every human being is ultimately a cultural animal. It is culture which differentiates us from the rest of the animal world. Culture is the definition of homo sapiens sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens is a culture creating animal. And that is the distinction between us and the rest of it. We know for a fact that all human beings started from Africa. We know that Homo sapiens sapiens started from Africa. We know also, therefore, that culture started from Africa. And if culture started from Africa, then language started from Africa. But I, I've known this for about 30 years, 40 years. I don't think we need to belabor this point anymore. We don't need to be thumping our chest. We need to be acting, yeah. doing things, knowing these, because this is common knowledge now. We don't need to be repeating it to ourselves all the time. We need to act on the basis of a knowledge. Now, within the structure of culture, within the overall scientific structure of culture, culture being everything which is the result of the creativity of humans, tangible and intangible, everything we use, but intangible also in the sense of the language we speak, our spirituality, religion, ritual, customs, usages, tastes, values, all of us are, form the intangible sections of culture together with the tangible. Furthermore, culture is generationally transferred, it's dynamic, it's ceaselessly changing. It never starts. When culture is static, then the people whose culture it is also cease to be who they are. They become other people. Because humans cannot live without culture. Now, if your culture dies, then it's what you call ethnocide. You become somebody else. You become somebody else. In other words, you don't necessarily have to die physically as a group. But if your culture and all your symbols, all your representations historically vanish, die, stagnate and die, then you cease to exist as the people you were before. Now, please, please listen. Now, this is important because it has other implications. It has the implication that ultimately, it is not biology which determines who we are. It is culture. This is why, this is why in Egypt today, you find people who are culturally totally Un-African, non-African, people who've come in since the middle of the 7th century AD and who have replaced the culture of the other people, the people who existed before then. 
and taking over the whole place, the whole society. See, we must keep this in mind that it's not biology which ultimately makes us, but it's culture. And the central pillar of culture, the central core of culture is language. It's language. It is in language that all our cultural habits are transacted. It's in language. Therefore, if we lose our languages, then we become other people. We become the people whose languages we speak. And nothing can then save us. Not our color will save us. I say that I have said in one of my books, Beyond the Color Line, that our color, in fact, is a blessing. Now, listen to me. Don't just jump to it. It's a blessing. I'll tell you why. Because all the other peoples of humanity, you see, if you look at Jews, Jews range from black to blonde. You look at Arabs, they range from black to blonde. You look at Indians, they from black to very light. You see. You see. But in other words, it's not a color reference for them. Being Jewish or being Arab. So ultimately not a color reference. It's a cultural reference because they have certain habits, cultural habits, which wherever they may be, unify and hold them together. A British Jew, a German Jew, uh, Argentinian Jew have said the bar mitzvah they share. It's a rite of passage. They go into the synagogue, they have their songs. All these are cultural habits. So it is our cultural habits we need to protect, please. And where they are weak, we must strengthen them. And in the diaspora, we must strengthen them. We must build them and strengthen them. That is the way to consolidate and protect ourselves. We must not inordinately focus on color. Because I call that not keeping our eyes on the ball. You see, when we focus over focus on co uh, color, what we suggest is that all the other things are okay, except the color problem. You see, that we lose track of the, the thing we have to protect is our history, our culture, our collective identity and being, the sense of being. A people. That is what we, and what will guarantee that is a cultural. At the center of culture is language. You find that all people on earth who make progress development wise work in their own languages. Let me sh give you examples, concrete examples. The Vietnamese, and throughout my life, I have watched them very closely because their struggle, the epic struggles against imperialism that they waged were always lessons for us. The Vietnamese today have the fastest rate of growth in the world. They're averaging the fastest for the last 15 years. Now, it's over 10%, but the Vietnamese use their own language. They don't use French, they were a French colony. They were a French colony. They don't use French. They use their own language. 
And it's on that basis that they are making rapid progress. The Indonesians used to be a Dutch colony, just like Suriname. The Indonesians today, since the 40s, since the time the Japanese left at the end of the Second World War, they are using Bahasa, their own language. The Malays in Malaysia, who were also a British colony, who got their independence long after, about seven months after Ghana. Today, they are major economic and technological players in the world. They use Bahasa, largely. I don't say that you don't learn any other language but your language, but you don't replace the centrality of your language with somebody else's language. Now, you can go on, you can look at, even in South Africa, where I live, the case of the Afrikaans, the so-called Afrikaans language. The Afrikaans language was actually started by the Malay, the Cape Malay slaves, because the Dutch brought slaves from Indonesia and Malaysia, and from West Africa, and from East Africa, and from Southern Africa, into the Cape. Now, the language Afrikaans was started as what they call a Kombe style. Kombe style, that is a kitchen language, as a language of the servants, and like a creolized, pigeonized version of Dutch. That's how it started. The language of the servants, how they used to talk to the masters. But it was appropriated by the masters. When their link with Holland broke, largely after the Napoleonic Wars. The English under Somerset, Lord Charles Somerset, tried to impose English on the Dutch people, on the Dutch-speaking people. They resisted, right up to Lord Milner. Milner was the last person who tried to force, bring even English teachers from England to force English on the Dutch. But the Dutch, remember, are white people, just like the English. Now, one of the two foremost Dutch generals, Boer generals, called Steyn, Martinez Steyn, he was the so-called president of the Orange Free State, together with Kruger, who was president of Transvaal in the final years of the 19th century. In 1913, he sent a telegram that was three years after the Act of Union in 1910. Sent a telegram to the Talfish, they call it, this language festival, Afrikaans language festival in 1913 in Cape Town. And he said, and because I speak Dutch also, so I understand Afrikaans and so on. I studied in Holland many years. It says, the Taal van de Onderdrukker, in the Mond van de Onderdrukker, is in Taal van Slaven. The language of the conqueror in the mouth of the conquered is a language of slaves. This is, this is a Dutch white boy leader, general, talking about the language of another white group. It's not about color. It's not about color. He's talking about culture. And if you read the diaries and the writings of the Boer leaders, in the whole period around the Anglo-Boer War, they were fighting about, about their culture, the preservation of their culture. That was what, the, for them, was the most important thing. Now, 
I keep saying I've been writing a series of articles now, keeping our eyes on the ball, which I'm stressing this. But please let us not. It's important for us to know that in racist societies we have to fight racism. But when we make racism the ultimate fight, then we lose track of the real fight, which is our preservation culturally. Our preservation culturally. Because as I told you, you can't tell the difference between a Japanese and a Chinese or a Korean, and yet they've been at each other's throats for centuries. Japanese colonizing Koreans, there's no difference between forcing their ladies to become prostitutes for their soldiers and so on, butchering Chinese in Shanghai. Japanese did. Millions. You know, making reference to them as subhuman types and yet they look identical. So every time, our situation is such that everywhere we've lived with the white persons, white persons, they've used our color as instruments of oppression. And because the factors of language, religion, these customary habits have become so loose for us, they are able to push us in different directions. But I say that because of our color, our sense of identity is, is saved. That's why I say it's a blessing. Because if you come into any group of people, a million people in the world anywhere from all corners, and you look around, 500 meters, 600 meters, you will pick out people of African descent without trouble. So the same factor which others have used to denigrate and oppress us, at the same time, in the face of the weakness of some of these cultural linkages for us, are our, is our blessing. But please let's not overwork it, overdo it, and make it the end in itself, because it's, it's not the end in itself. Very soon there will be times when some of us will be very light. And yet, if we maintain the cultural bonds, that it, then it doesn't matter, we are still the same people. And let us not drift into the situation of the, you are not as dark as my mother, therefore you are not. That, that's all nonsense because that's what comes out of the over-focus on color. You see, when we should be focusing more on our history and our culture, which hold us together. Now, so when I realized that, I thought, goodness, what, has, what do we do about it? What do we concretely do in order to push this program of our languages further? So I retired a senior professor emeritus from the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town in 1997. And I set up the center for the Center for Advanced Studies of African Society. And um, to work almost exclusively on the question of African languages, how to develop them in order to use them to, to move forward. I realized that the first task would be to bring some order into the chaos of numbers of African languages. And some of the first people I had to fight was UNESCO because in publications even by UNESCO, they were suggesting that there are between 1,125 and 2,250 languages in Africa, that by a factor of 1,000, 1,050%, 1, 
They cannot tell how many languages there are in Africa. But they, knew, they know everywhere there is gold, the diamond, oil. But they, they couldn't tell us how many languages there are in Africa. I said, this, this is the first problem we need to solve, bring some order. Because you see, the logic is that the logic they follow then is that if there are so many languages, then you can't use African languages to make progress. Then you must rely on the colonial languages. That's, that's the way the argument goes, you see. So I started working with other people other academics of like mind, I started finding out who is who on the African continent and in terms of linguists and anthropologists who have the same sort of sense of direction and sense of mission. And we started working hard, creating workshops and publishing books on the what we discovered very soon after that was that most of what are called separate languages in Africa are actually not separate languages, but dialectal variants of larger languages. You see, dialectal variants of larger languages. That the difference, for example, between Zulu Isi Zulu and Isi Kosa is like the difference between broad Yorkshire and deep Cockney from Whitechapel. They are, they are not, or you go further north to Aberdeenshire and you spell B U C K E T and the fellow says book it. And you come to Sussex, and he says, it's bucket. And you can write the two differently, if you choose. And on paper, you, will be, have, you have two different words, <coughs> if you like. Now, the missionary groups in competition with each other translated the Bible often with their own orthographies, with their own spelling systems. So that on paper, for one language, you may have five different scripts, different spelling systems. So that if the people spoke, who speak these dialectal variants spoke to each other, they would understand each other perfectly. But if they were reading, they would be reading two different scripts. For example, where he comes from, and he tells me he's from the Sese Isles. I did some work there some years ago in Uganda. And what I did was that we produced materials on CD on maize pest, insect pest against maize, malaria, HIV AIDS, etc. And I went to the village not too far from Kampala, and saw some, a group of villagers. We brought them together in the village hall uh, to share the materials with them. So we put them on the television screen, put the CD in. Now, it was a village made largely of Soga speakers, Soga and Luganda. It's a Basoga and Baganda people. The two varieties they speak are more or less the same. And yet if you ask them, they'll tell you, oh, no, I'm Soga. And no, he's Muganda, you see. And yet they can understand each other perfectly. But they speak slightly different dialectal variants of the same language. Lexically, it's 95% the same. There'd be 5% which are dif different. So I put the thing on the television. And I asked one of the ladies, please, can you read us? And the person read it completely. Then I asked the Musoga, 
please, can you also read this text? And she was reading the same thing again, properly. And I said, why do you want us to write two different versions for, for your language, when you can both read the same thing? Now, that problem is all over Africa. All over Africa. See? The biggest language in terms of geographical spread in Africa is called Tukluer, Pearl. It's one language. It's called Fulful, Fulful de Pearl, Pearl, Pular, Tukluer. Fulani, sometimes Felata. Famously, it's known as Fulfulde, Fulani. It's throughout West Africa. It's spoken in different pockets by different minorities in about 13 countries, ranging from the Senegambia into Mauritania, into the Guinea coast, all the way into North Cameroon, Adamawa area and onto the borders of the Sudan by small, small groups, you see. Then you have another language like Bambara. Bambara is also a very big language spoken about eight countries, you know. It's called Kasonke, Bamanan, Bambara, Jula. It's all the same, same, same language, you see. And then you have, you have, so you have this sort of situation all over. One of the biggest is the low language in East Africa. It's in Ethiopia, Sudan border area, as Anyuak, Shiluk, Lafon, Juchol. And then on the border between Sudan and, and Uganda, it's known as Acholi, then it becomes Lango, and then Topadola, Aluo, and then the lake shore in North Tanzania is Luo, in Kisumu area, Kenya is Luo, and in Uganda, lake shore is Luo also. You see? So you have this sort of situation all across Africa. In West Africa, one of the Widest spreading one is, is what they call now by Professor Kapo of the University of uh, Abomekala V as Be. Be means language. And it is for the group of languages where the people call themselves the people who speak Be. It's called Aja in the corner of Nigeria, Badagri area. You cross the border into Benin, it's called Aja also. But it's called also Fong, Fong Be in Benin, Mina, Gon, and then in Togo is Mina and Ewe, and in Ghana is Ewe. It's basically the same language, you see. Now you can go on, you can go. In Kenya, there is the, what they call the Akamba, Gema, Kamba, Gikuyu, Embu, Meru, Glastra also mutually intelligible. In Southern Africa, with two or three languages, you can move around the whole region, which is twice bigger than the whole of Western Europe. That is the Nguni languages, that's Zulu, Kosa, Seswati, Seswati, Sindebele. Sindebele is half of um, uh, Zimbabwe. Sindebele also, in South Africa, as spoken by the Ndebeles, Zulu in South Africa, Swati in Swaziland, Kosa in South Africa, it's basically the same. 90% of them would understand each other when they are speaking. If you take a village man from one and you drop him in another village in the other side, for 90%, he would say, well, it's a version of my language. It's a slightly different version. But they would understand each other. So you have this sort of problem right through Africa. 
You see, and what we did, what we're doing, what we have done. Unfortunately, I haven't brought any of the publications. But if you Google my center, you will see all of it there. You see, what we we've been doing is that we put together linguists, African linguists, mother tongue linguists, and then we put them through workshops, two, three workshops, to rewrite a harmonized, standardized orthography, spelling system for the other languages. And then we publish it. And, and I can tell you that now we have done more than half of the big languages in Africa. We have to date done. That is the work I have been doing, you know, as a foundation. Because anybody who wants to use African languages to develop its languages of science and technology has to start there. So we're laying the foundations for that. And we're making progress. I can tell you that I never imagined that the African government, stubborn and unfortunately stupid sometimes as they are, would start accepting this work that we do. But they have. They have, they have they've started accepting it. Four or five weeks ago, I signed a memorandum of understanding with the government of Zambia. We have produced for them school books, all levels of primary school, for all the official languages from grade one to grade eight, based, based on the harmonized orthographies that my center has been producing. We've done it for Zimbabwe also. We've done it for Zimbabwe for the Shona languages. Yeah. You know, yeah. Shona starts, the group, the family starts from North Botswana as Kalanga, Lilima, Barwe, Heshwa, Kore Kore, Karanga, Kalanga, Manika, Ndao. Ute in Mozambique. We have harmonized that also. We've harmonized that. We are also producing dictionaries for these languages. In his place, we have harmonized and produced books for Uganda, for all the official languages with the University, Makerere University staff and we produce also the same readers basic readers from grade one to grade seven yes, yes. in uganda yes, yes. now so we're doing this work steadily because if we want to be able to use our languages then we must first harmonize them those that are the same should be written in the same way more or less the same. We write them in the same way. And that way we'll be able to make progress. So I think bit by bit, I will work only about three, four more years than I will withdraw for a younger person to take over. And, uh, but we're making progress. So my message is that now let me reflect a bit on what should be, we should be doing with these things in the diaspora. I have said before, many times, that some of the things we could be doing in the diaspora would be to be organizing uh, weekend meetings for children, to expose them to films, schools, uh, languages which they want to learn or pick up and doing, having Africa-centered events to give them a stronger sense of cultural heritage and belonging. That, that we need to do this systematically, just like the Jewish people do, like the Muslims do, like the Indians, Hindus do, 
we must also do, we must not be pointing fingers at them cheating us all the time. Yes. If, if you leave yourself to be cheated, you will be cheated. We have to organize ourselves for ourselves in our own interest and not expect that somebody will change. Nobody does that. We have to do it for ourselves. So my message is that please let's be more organized along those lines. Let's be more organized along those lines to do things for ourselves and to lift ourselves by the bootstraps, either or economic organization. There are many people who come together, create capital for one family, and that family helps another family. They do that all the time. You find that in the Chinese communities, in the Indian communities, and, and they buy from each other, they help each other, and so on. But we have not started doing that sort of thing properly. Yeah. And that's why we, you know, we want to blame others all the time. You know, yes, others are to blame. Yes, that's true. But other people also suffered from the same agency that we have suffered. But they, they've escaped this. And until such time that we get the story right in that respect, we will always be the bottom of the heap. And, complaining all the time. I will stop here and give you some short time, five minutes to interact, ask questions, throw my questions out of the window, um, queries, observations, etc. Thank you.